Special Operations, Covert Ops, Espionage, The Team House, with your hosts, Jack Murphy and David Park. Hi everyone, I'm Jack Murphy, here with my co-host Dave Park. This is sort of the team house. It is, but it isn't. This is a bonus episode, a midweek bonus episode. We usually do these for uh, our Patreon subscribers, and if they're a little bit off the beaten path, sometimes it's just Dave and me and myself BSing about various subjects and drinking more than we probably should. Other times we have uh, friends of ours come on and guests come on. Um, and this is, you know, just sort of a, uh, I guess, a freebie for you folks out there. And I'm really happy to have today uh, a friend of mine, Chuck Rogers, who is a writer. He writes in the uh, men's adventure genre, if that's still a genre. But I think even more than that, he's probably the best action adventure writer out there today. Yeah. My, hum- my humble opinion. Uh, Chuck wrote for a long time uh, on the Mac Bolin series, The Executioner, which was a long-running series from, like, 1969 to just the last year, I think. So probably one of the longest series in American history, I think. And now he's kind of struck off on his own. He writes uh, Heroes Road. There are two books in that series out there. It's a fantasy series. And then he has written a post-apocalyptic uh, novel called Bastard of the Apocalypse, which is also awesome. And we'll talk all about that. So, uh, Chuck, really happy to have you here tonight. It's my pleasure. Absolutely, man. So the, the first question we start all of our episodes off with is we ask our guest about their origin story. So if uh, you have a superhero origin story, if you got bitten by a radioactive spider, or maybe they put you in a big vat of fluid and they melded adamantium metal to your skeleton to give you claws. I, I, I don't know how it happened. I can't possibly... You fall into a vat of acid? I, I don't know. So we're relying on you to kind of like lay this out for us. Like, What's your origin st- uh, story, Chuck? Uh, I was... Born in Southern California, raised in Northern California, uh, and I come from a family of writers. And there's not a vat of acid in that any, anywhere. Uh, becoming a published writer is actually torturous enough that you really don't <laughs> need the vat of acid. You don't need to get bitten by the spider. You got plenty of pain, blues, and agony to get you through that. <laughs> so growing up in, in Southern California, uh, who in your family was a writer? I mean, I, I take it that growing up, you must have been around writers then, and this was an introduction to the, to the profession for you. Uh, my father was a writer. And when I was growing up, I always knew I wanted to be one. Uh, when I was a little kid, if it was your birthday, there's a chance I was probably going to write some sort of short story for you on some green binder paper. So I just always knew. And then my father was writing magazine articles. And then I started doing that. And then then I wrote my first book. And I shopped it around. Actually, I sort of nepotismed on top of my father's agent. And nibble here, nibble there, not much going on. And then my father's agent showed it to Gold Eagle, who did the Executioner series. And they said, wow, we, we really like this book. And I'm all, wow, that's great. Thanks. So, but we don't want to buy it. And I'm all, no. They're all, we want you to write this Mac Boland stuff. Remember, this is in the 80s. I'm all, isn't that that vigilante crap you buy in the, uh, the airport? And they're all, yeah. I'm all, no. And they offered me money. I said, ooh. And I took it. <laughs> and I'm all, woo, I'm an author now. And like to quote my brother, He's like, let me get this straight. Your name doesn't appear on the cover. And I'm all, no. He's like, you don't get any royalties. I'm all, no. He's all, so you're a whore now. And I'm all, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's how my writing career really started. What, what was your first book that they passed on? It was uh, Men's Action. It was called The Dying Man. And it was, that was going to be overarching name of the series, The Dying Man, colon. The first one was Vengeance is Mine. It's sort of based on Doc Holliday. Like uh-huh. people, he wasn't the fastest gunfighter. He wasn't the most accurate, but he wanted to die. So everyone was scared of him. Uh-huh. And so it's basically about this cop. He finds out he has this terminal disease, which we never established what it is. 
he becomes an alcoholic, drops off the force. And this was in the 80s. So the Colombian drug cartels were big and the Colombian drug cartels kill his partner. And so he basically just goes on a suicide run as a vigilante to take them out. That sounds great. I need to rewrite it, except everything's 80s. So I have to rewrite the book as there's cell phones, there's computers. Uh, Nobody's so wearing, one of these days, I'll dust it off. Nobody's wearing parachute pants anymore? There's enough 80s nostalgia now at this point. Like People of my age and a little bit uh, older are getting to that point where they're getting very nostalgic about the 80s, I think. Yeah, even if you do it as a period piece. You know, you're not the first person to say that. And uh, speaking of the 80s, I'm going to go see Billy Idol in concert tomorrow. Very nice. And the mm -hmm. last time I saw him, I had the exact same haircut. As Man, I, it was. <laughs> I love Billy Idol so much. So He's the rocker. For, yeah. uh, for folks who don't know, what is the Executioner series? What is Mac Bolan? Mac Bolan, one, as you mentioned, is the longest running series in any language that we know of, there's over 400 books. If you throw in the Super Bolans and the uh, Stony Men, and it was actually probably the first book where a Vietnam veteran came home, and in this case, the Italian mafia had messed with his family, and he decides to go after them. And the story's been done a thousand times, but to Donald Pelton, as far as I know, was the first. Right. And yeah. It just took off. Yeah. For any comic book fans out there. I mean, we know we know Mac Bolan is the Punisher. I mean, that's basically where the Punisher yeah. ripped off lock, yeah. stock, and barrel. Yeah, and and even I mean, a lot of, like the War Journal, the the War Wagon, like a lot of the stuff that's in the Punisher came straight out of Mac Bolan. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I'd argue that nobody really did it as well as uh, as Don Pendleton did. Uh, his, his writing is up there with Robert E. Howard. I mean, it, as far as the, the prose and the way, when you read it, you feel like you're right there with the guy. You know, It was clean. It was crisp. His delivery was awesome. And the cool thing was, if when you read it back then, it had never been done before. Right. So it was fresh. Right. Yeah, it was cool. I mean, he's the, the type of uh, protagonist, the type of hero that you want to root for, you know? Yeah, he absolutely was. Um, so how did, uh, how did you like that? How did you like writing for Mac Bolin? And now you're in the 1980s and you're writing this vigil vigilante fiction. Um, and also you're writing for an audience that consists of a lot of military veterans and a lot of like gun nerds, guys who are like yeah. really into that kind of stuff. And you're kind of coming into it without that sort of background. What, what was this whole experience? How, how did you, you know, kind of, uh, get into it, I guess, so to speak. Uh, like I said, the first book I wrote was, was I didn't know the term back then, but it was men's action. Mm -hmm. uh, like I said, well, I didn't tell. My father was in the Korean War. He was a Ford observer. And so he was one of my best editors. And when I got combat wrong, he would kind of go, uh, Chuck, come here. That's not <laughs> what people think. It's not how people act. <laughs> uh, that, that was a good for cleaning things up. Uh, I was pretty good at innovating violence from the get-go. And learning military jargon came along uh, towards the latter part of my uh, Mac Bolan career. Uh, viewers will love to know that uh, Mr. Jack Murphy was one of my uh, technical consultants who would actually send me ideas going, dude, do you know about this? I'm like, I've never heard of that. So that was, that was always good fun when I got an email from you. And uh, then I learned by doing it. And by the time you write 37 of them, you know everything about every military on the face of the planet yeah just from the research it, it, did your dad write any mac bolan novels he wrote geez two or three of the stony men which is okay. like their, their action team and he actually wrote a three book series for gold eagle called uh god what was that called it was the i think it was the terror trilogy or something like that it was about this special team that no one knew about and it took care of, took place over a three book arc in the middle east i'll have to look that up pretty cool so the years i mean you wrote for mac bolin you wrote for gold eagle for a long time i did it was um uh, you could say i almost got in a trap except one i was getting paid to do what i want which is writing and two i was getting paid it was a check 
two or three times a year. And if I had any regrets, I probably should have jumped off that series earlier, but it was a kick in the pants. I, I never really burnt out, which a lot of the GE authors did. I mean, I liked the series, even the last book I wrote, I was still having fun with it. Did you, how much, what, when they offered you the job, how, how much, how many of the Mac Bolins did you go back and read just to get a sense of it and also to make sure that you weren't duplicating work and things like that? Oh, here's the funny thing is that uh, before I ever got offered the job, before my father ever wrote for Gold Eagle, uh, both of my parents read the Mac Bolins. So there's like 30 of them already around the house. Okay. So that was neat. That was neat. And I'd, I'd, I'd already read a bunch of them. It's actually kind of cool going, I'm, I'm, I'm writing for this series. Check yeah. Out. Yeah. It's, it's so funny that you, uh, you say that, you know, like, I feel like, uh, and I, I keep mentioning him, but Robert Howard would be very honest, like, this is a job for me. It's a business. As talented a writer and as serious as he was about it, it's a business. Just like you're saying, it's, it's a check. And writing is. Write, writing is work, and it is a job. And uh, I think that's just such a different point of view than the, all, all of the pulp authors back in the day were very much of that sort of mindset. Auto writers nowadays are so pretentious and they're talking about their craft and my art and oh my God and on and on. It's, oh, I can't stand listening to it. If I'm going to get snooty at all, it's, it's kind of a calling. You feel drawn to do it, but it, flat out, it's, it's a job like anything else. It's a, it, it's writers a job. Write or, and published writers write and submit. <laughs> and that sort of weeds out the chaff to a great extent. Right, right. And, but it's something you love at the same time. I do. I can't imagine not doing it. I right. always knew I want to do it, and I'll need someone to pat me on the head and go, Chuck, you're, you're done. <laughs> Just, <laughs> so you had a lot of fun writing the, uh, the Mac Bolin novels, and, and hell, I had a lot of fun reading them. I, I loved uh, a Chuck Rogers Mac Bolin novel, or you did a few Stony Man novels also, and uh, they were always a trip. I loved reading them, and I think that's how we first got connected, actually. Um, and then of course, you know, in the latter, the latter years, I started, you know, sending you all, all these like things I think would be cool to put into them. Yes, you did. Those are some <laughs> fun emails. <laughs> um, so as time goes on, you're thinking in the back of your mind about your own series, about what you want to write, what you want to do. Yeah. And, uh, I would admit at a certain point I was getting tired of it. And I guess at one of the editors sense, I said, Chuck, how would you like to write a Deathlands? And in the Gold Eagle world, the Deathlands is the, mm -hmm. it's, it's the, the bottom of the pit. It's the only, they considered it garbage. And if the people publishing consider it garbage, then, you know, but I'm all, it's a hundred years after a nuclear war. What's not to like? Right. So uh, I wrote three of those after I got done with uh, Mac Bolan. And I had so much fun, I didn't know what to do. And the, the joke about Chuck's Deathlands run, I only wrote three of the books, and none of them were set in the Deathlands. I, one I put on a pirate ship, one I put in the Azores, one I put in Canada. And the long-haul truckers in Canada lost their mind. I got fan letters. Really? In the Great White North. Yeah. <laughs> well, I could go and have these nostalgic moments as well. I mean, what, what was the one you wrote? Uh, the Mac Bolan novel, Prison Code, where Mac Bolan gets put in prison? That was the most fun I ever had in The Executioner. I submitted, I wanted to, do, I wanted to put him in prison. And they were, no, 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 we can't put him in prison. Like, what do you mean? He's like, we don't like it when you put him on a boat. We don't like you put him in an underground complex. We don't want him in a prison. We don't want him in some place or on a train. We don't want him confined. He needs to be moving around. So I said, uh, listen, I can make the prison thing work, and we'll dovetail it with action at the start and then of course we'll have a big breakout and it'll finish outside the prison and the powers that be went uh, I'm like, you trusted me before and we did and boy that was fun just i had uh, she males who looked like marilyn monroe uh martial arts masters in cells I, I i just jumped off the leash i said all right this is one that gets me fired <laughs> and instead they they loved it there's yeah oh yeah let's not forget about the rape walrus uh chuck yes yeah, so i had a rape walrus that was uh that may have been the best description of a human being i ever came up with in my life 
And, it, and in that book, it's uh, the, the prison guards are making the prisoners fight for sport. Right, it's like a blood yes. sport competition. So, of course, Mac Bolin is getting thrown into the ring, and there, just total pandemonium ensues in that one. Uh, then, of course, Savage Game is like a fan favorite. Like everyone who's a Mac Bolin fan loves uh, loves that one, where Mac has to infiltrate a terrorist group and like get inside them. Right, that was the one where basically uh, our heroes, including Stoneman, they meet their. It's like the Star Trek episode where you have their evil opposites. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So this is basically if Mac Bolin and his buddies turn bad and start using all their powers and, and knowledge and skills to commit crimes, only person who could stop them, of course, is Mac Bolin and the Stony Man team. And that was a lot of fun to write. Uh, like most authors, you like to put your friends in the book. And a good friend of mine said, Chuck, you haven't put me in any of your books. I'm all right, do you want to be good? Or do you want to be or bad? He's like, man, make me evil. And so I said, okay, I'm going to make him the evil anti-Bolin. And then that thing just started writing itself. <laughs> and, yeah, that was that one was messed up, man. Where I, I'm going to give a little spoiler alert away. Mac Bolin gets buried alive in that in that novel. It's messed up. It's super messed up. What happens in that one? Uh, are there any other Mac Bolin novels before we move on here, Chuck? Like that you were like, man, I nailed that one. Like if, if somebody is going to read Mac Bolin, like that's the one you want to hand to them. Prison Code, Savage Game, and geez, I've, it's kind of like that episode of Saturday Night Live where William Shatner goes to a Star Trek con. They're asking him all these questions. Yeah, he's all, "I did that twenty years ago on a lark." I'm all, it's like, "I wrote thirty-seven of them." Um, I can't think of one off the top of my head. Prison Code, Savage Game, it's a good place to start in the Chuck Rogers Executioner Canon. What? What is it about the Mac Bullen series? Why don't they give the authors like the the byline, the you know, the credit? Oh, you do. If you open up the the book and you you go past the cover and you go in like three pages, there's a excuse me, there's a little byline that says, "We would like to thank Charles Rogers for his contribution <laughs> to this work." And you're like, "Thanks, buddy. That was great." Interesting. That's uh, but remember it was all written under the Donald Pendleton, his name, right? So they retained, I don't know what their deal was for uh, royalties and rights, but I was, to quote my brother, I was a whore. I was, I was doing r- contract work. Getting pimped out. Well, yeah, I, I, I hope people will go check out those. Uh, you can probably get them used or you know, pre-owned on Amazon, um, some of Chuck's old Mac Bowen novels, and they're definitely worth your time. Um, so... We talked about Deathlands. You wrote a, you wrote a couple of those. Those were like the twilight years of your time at Gold Eagle, I think. Yeah, um, I also tried to get fired from that gig uh, when I put our our party on a pirate ship. The bosun's name was Mister Manrape. <laughs> <laughs> I'm all this is it. <laughs> I'm done. And instead, they I just got one email from Kathy with a question mark going. Mr. Man Rape, really? <laughs> dot, 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 but they kept it all in. And so what he wanted to do was, was rape the youngest member of our party named Ricky. And so I had the whole Ricky Man Rape dynamic going on. Was, oh, God. Was fun. This reminds me of the Mac Bowen novel where he's in the Congo with the Boy Scout troop and he's trying to save him from cannibals. Right. That was, uh, that was one of yours, Chuck. Don't lie. Yes, that was one of mine. Well, the one nice thing people said about my Bolins was, even though there were hundreds of books in the series, I kept trying to find new things to do. Yeah, yeah. And I think I had just seen the movie uh, Tears of the Sun. If you remember that one? Yeah. Oh, we all remember that one. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I just had this idea, all right, uh, a rescue in the Congo, but it's a group of military cadets who went down, who were on some conference in South Africa, and yeah, the Lord's Army or some equivalent and the military coming in and these evil i remember was it you who told me that in the congo someone had hired serbian mercenaries for security and they misbehaved so badly and so i had all these forces descending on the kids and mac and parachutes in and it's uh he he takes them and makes them into men and turns them into fighters and even though some of them are girls and it, yeah that was another one that's kicking the pants <laughs> 
Uh, sorry, I keep leading you like way astray on these. Like taps the movie where they where like a bunch of cadets like like yeah, that, there was that was a bit of an influence. Yeah. Oh, Jack, you mentioned the burial scene of Mac Bolan mm-hmm. about. Uh, geez, I think it was six months or a year after it came out. Someone emailed me and said, "Have you seen uh, that Quentin Tarantino movie?" Well, no, not yet. Why? And thought, dude, Tarantino, he ripped you off at the whole burial scene. I went somewhere, really? I don't know. Maybe I'm... Since I started writing screenplays, I sort of have this dream that I'll get invited to a Hollywood party. Quentin Tarantino is going to be there. <laughs> uh, hey, do you like Mac Bowling execution books? He's like, I love those books and blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, I wrote Savage Game. And just to watch it, hopefully he'll turn pale a little bit. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, again, this is going to sound like a, a pretentious writer moment myself. My, my second novel, uh, Target Deck, sees our hero down in Mexico fighting drug cartels. And the whole plot of the book, essentially what unravels is in the background, there's this conspiracy that what the CIA is doing is trying to play these cartels against each other and like knock off some of the weaker ones so that they can be unified within one cartel that the CIA controls. And so there's this big consolidation. And then that movie Sicario comes out, where, as it turns out, there's this big CIA conspiracy to unify all the cartels in Mexico under one singular cartel. It's like, welcome, brother. Spoiler alert, I haven't seen it. No. Sicario? Don't. It's, I haven't not, seen it's a it. stupid movie. I, and it, you know, you, I know you guys are joking around about, you know, like, the craft, and the, it was a job, but, I mean, you're a very prolific writer. Did you have, did you have a formula, or not necessarily in the in the sense that it was formula, formulaic, but did you have a process that you followed? That how you would build a novel? Do you do, you do outlines? Like what what's that look like for you? Um, when I first started writing for Gold Eagle, they wanted outlines, and I hate outlines. And it, when I do write an outline, it the book by the first quarter of it has already jumped the rails. So I just said, you know, guys, and they go, well, Chuck, you kind of went off the outline. I'm, all, I'm never going to stay on the outline. And they said, all right, we trust you. So then I never wrote another one. I basically come up with an idea for a story. And then I start starting notes and notes and notes and notes until I have just pages of notes. And I start stringing them together in scenes. But I've, I've never been an outline guy. So you're very, uh, I guess, a pantser, like by the seat of your pants. I mean, do you know where you want the story to go or... Do you not where where you want it to end? I mean, or do you not really care? Um, once you start writing, I, I'm not too but if you're any good, your story should start writing itself to a great degree. Uh-huh. But I I know always I always know how it starts, and unless there's just some cataclysmic thing in the middle, I always know how it's going to end. And then then there's the big empty in the middle where you need to connect everything. That's, that's oh, another another one of yours that just come, came to mind is there was one where you had Mac Bolin in Central Asia with a group of mercenaries, and one of them's this big muscle-bound ranger who's like a dumbass, which I thought was a totally accurate characterization. Um, but there was... Uh, the rangers they, they, are a noble institution. Oh, we know, we know. <laughs> uh, but there's something where they're, they're after uh, Alexander the Great Sword. It's like some ancient artifact that they're looking for. Yeah. Yeah, that one they uh, unfortunately that was when they cut down their Page size line. of the books dramatically, and a whole bunch of that got cut. I, w- I was not pleased. I, I love the story, but to me, they cut so much that it almost didn't hang together. It was fun, but it, it, it's uh, and this is yeah, this is a criticism of you know uh, I guess the publisher in that sense is that like some of these books ended like way too abruptly. It's like, could you give the author just like one or two more pages just to kind of wrap this thing up? Well, the thing when you're contract writing is you have almost no say. Mm-hmm. Uh, I set Mac Bolin in, in uh, Argentina. And so him and his buddies, they steal these two planes. I think they're called Pucaras. It's one of the prop driven attack planes. And one has guns, can barely fly. And one can fly, but doesn't have any guns. So what they end up doing it's flying them both in the enemy mansion as these Nazis who went down to Argentina, their, their third generation. And they came back and they said, no, no, Chuck, it's too close to 9-11. You can't have two planes crashing into a building. I'm like, really? Really? So I had to have them 
streak overhead and then eject and then land on the roof while the planes sailed off and hit a building. Was, huh? While the planes sailed off and hit a building. <laughs> the, uh, the protagonist the campus. We never really knew what found yeah, out. Yeah, that the protagonist didn't know about. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, oh man, this is, I start remember more and more. I got to stop. Uh, so you try to get fired from Deathlands by making completely inappropriate side characters. Yeah, <laughs> how it's completely appropriate. It propelled the plot. <laughs> how did? So how did, how did you end up finally leaving Gold Eagle? Like, did they give you the hard goodbye? How did that happen, Chuck? No, it's actually really nice. Um, I told them I'm going to self-publish Heroes Road. I'm going to have to write book two. And no, I, I, there's a lot of writers who complained about GE. Mm-hmm. I never had a problem. I had a great relationship with them. Uh, the stuff they let me get away with, um, I don't think I ever met a deadline, and they were very patient with me. <laughs> And uh, actually, I did, after the Deathlands, write one more Mac Bolin. And then I got into Heroes Road. And I'm babbling off. What was the, what was the number? Uh, about, about how you left Gold Eagle. Because that's on very good terms. And yeah. uh, geez, a couple times after that, I'd get an email going, Chuck, do you have any desire to write a Mac? Bolin or a Deathlands, and all. I, that by that time I was way into my own career. But it's nice that they offered. Yeah, no, and unfortunately, I mean, Gold Eagle is defunct now, isn't it? They last I checked, they were putting out Mac Bolins, but only on ebook, and they are still putting out Deathlands, but those are, I believe, either ebook or you can buy them off of a graphic audio. I. Th- I think the last Mac Bolin came out. I think it was, uh, yeah, I think it was last year, 2020. You may be right. Yeah, it, because I remember seeing um, Don's widow, Linda, um, saying how the rights had returned back to the estate. Uh-huh. Oh, so Gold, so gold Eagle, probably, they, if they weren't, like, getting the honey, then they Yeah, they shut, they shut it down, so I think the rights of the series returned to um, Don, Don's widow. Yeah. Um, real nice lady, by the way. Yeah, she is. She's super cool. Um, so uh, talk to us about that transition of you know leaving behind this job that you've had for a long time working for this publishing house, and now you're striking off on your own. Tell us about how that materialized and how Heroes Road kind of germinated. Uh, I'd actually written the first Heroes Road book uh, decades ago, and Again, my father's agent shopped it around. It got a few nibbles. Tor Books liked it. Bain liked it, but they did end up not publishing it. And so it just started languishing. Mm-hmm. And so one of the reasons I took the Mac Bolin was, you know, I'll just write a few of these Mac Bolin books and wait for Heroes Road to hit. And then like 37 books later, <laughs> I was that deep into GE and uh, Heroes Road hadn't sold. And friends of mine started saying, well, Chuck, you know, there's this thing publishing on Amazon, self-publishing, you know, why don't you do that? I'm like, eh, I don't know. Because if, if you come from, this is gray hair, back in the day, self-publishing was considered as a vanity project. Right. No one does it. But I looked into it and I said, yeah, all right, I'll try it. And I needed a cover artist and you hooked me up with Mark Lee and Heroes Road was born. Yeah, Mark. Uh, Mark is the man. He did the covers for all four of, of my novels. So we, we, if you come and ask me who's going to be, uh, I need a cover artist for my novels. Of course, Mark is going to be the first person I'd, I'd recommend. And he did the covers for Heroes Road One and Two, and he did Bastard the and Bastard of the, He did all of them. Mark is knocked him out of the ballpark. Mark's awesome. Uh, you guys can. Uh, I'll, I'll have to pull up his website for you, but uh, Mark Lee. He is an artist based out of Singapore. Um, he actually served in the Singaporean reserves as uh, there's conscription national service there. And he's a, I believe he's a full-time digital artist. Last time I talked, he's also teaching at an art school. Is he? Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah, he's amazing. Um, and I want to have Mark actually on the show sometime. And I'd like to have him come on and demonstrate some of his art and how he, how he does it. Um, actually, oh, on a, you absolutely should. Actually, on, on a live show, and I'm still kind of trying to twist his arm and talk him into it. Um, so, 
Heroes Road was kind of written. Um, you looked into self publishing. You decided now is the time. Uh, I needed the money, <laughs> so I said, "Yeah, now is the time." And it's it's a weird road to hoe, but I like the fact that I don't have deadlines. Mm -hmm. um, there is no editor telling me what I can do and can't do, so it, it's neat in that regard. Uh, that you you don't have anyone pushing your book, no one's doing your marketing for you, so you have to do a whole lot of humping on your own. Do you feel as though the advantages and disadvantages of having a publisher versus self-publishing, that, that it's a fair trade? If you have an agent, um, and I had one who, bless his heart, wasn't that good at it. It was, it was something he's doing as a side project. Even then, if Jack's my agent and he takes my book, and it goes to Hooten Mifflin or wherever, we're utterly dependent on one person liking the book. And right. if that uh, editor doesn't like it, then you, you get shit canned. So with, with self-publishing, it's your gig. And if you just track some notice, you can take off without anyone's you know, say-so or buy your leave. Yeah. That's the joy of it. The problem is there's now just anyone and their brother can publish. Right. So it's not, mm -hmm. this is just a sea of garbage out there. And the problem is getting, getting noticed. Well, I think I mean, you can tell me if I'm wrong, but I think one of the advantages to self publishing, especially if we're speaking specifically on Amazon and with Kindle is that you can do the Kindle prime, which, uh, which I think a lot of publishers are not willing to do. And with Kindle prime, like uh, right now I'm in, I'm in a stage like, because there are so many authors and so many people that self-publishing that if it's not on Kindle Prime and, and I don't I haven't heard a lot about the book, I probably won't I won't pay money for it. Um, right. but but I I will read it I will read it on Kindle Prime. And I know the author still gets a couple, you know, still gets money for a book read on Prime. Well, actually I make more money on Kindle Prime than I do on actual book sales. Uh, Jack's Red Heroes Road, it's a, it's a doorstopper. Mm -hmm. And on Kindle Prime, as an author, you get paid for every page that's swiped. Yeah, so interesting. Use really big font, have lots of space between your paragraphs, get that book as thick as you can. <laughs> so so I, would, I would say this for anybody watching this who are, or who's going to watch it in the future is, you know, if you want to support authors, even if their genres aren't your genres, if you're not a big fantasy per, you know, reader, but you want to support the author, especially if it's on Kindle Prime, download the book, swipe through it, you know, and you're, you know, swipe through it, read it if you want. But if you don't have the time, swipe through it and, and help and get paid. And that's a, if you did that with Heroes Road, you'd be swiping for about 45 minutes. <laughs> I just can't imagine that working out too well. Do it during one of our shows. You got plenty of time. <laughs> And I, Thank you for your support. I, you know, even if uh, you're not a big like fan of the fantasy genre, which I was telling Chuck before uh, the show started, that I, I'm really not necessarily a big fan of the fantasy genre because I feel like these authors write these huge books and they want you to get invested in this world they're building. Um, I, I, so I kind of avoid fantasy as a genre normally, although uh, there are a few exceptions. And, uh, and I'd say Chuck, uh, Chuck's book, uh, Heroes Road, is one of them. Because first and foremost, it is a Chuck Rogers action adventure novel. It's not just him bombarding you with uh, lore uh, about this world. It's actually a very exciting, fast-paced novel. Um, and so it's a, it's a lot of fun. Do you want to tell people a little bit about well, uh, what it's about, Chuck, and how it came about? I always I love the fantasy genre. I always knew I wanted to write one. And... One of the nicest compliments I get on my writing was uh, like the Mac Bolins. People say, you know, Chuck, you, you put a different spin on it. You did something, something mm -hmm. new. I, I wasn't expecting a bunch of kids being shot down in a plane or, my God, you put them in prison. So I was looking to do something different in fantasy. As we were talking before the show, uh, I myself got tired of, like you said, of all the world building. And here's this guy named Bith of Lothlorien, and he has to go to the Magic Mountain and there's these people called the Norman, they're Vikings, and it's just here's the Dothraki, and they're actually Mongols, and you right, right, all right, and there's endless names, and then there's here you have all these weird elven names, and one guy named Ned, 
sorry, R.R. Martin. And so a lot of the naming didn't make sense. So I just said, no, I'm going to set it in medieval Europe that's slightly different. So everyone's heard of Wales, where our hero is from. His buddy Snorri is from the Russias. Everyone's heard of Russia. And from there, it, the first book is basically, I, I hate the comparison, but it's sort of a Dungeons and Dragons quest. You have these two warriors, a thief, a sorcerer, a, a fallen priest who's a cleric, and they're off on this quest. Which you're not sure what they're going for, and the, the sorcerer is very secretive about it. And the quest starts getting stranger and stranger as they go from Russia through what we call the Stan countries these days. And all this is happening as something horrible that's going to affect the entire planet is happening just off screen. And the how, how much spoilers do you want? It's your book, Chuck. You're the uh, you're the, you're the you're the dungeon master. Here, I, so. I would for for <laughs> me, I would say uh, I spoil as little as possible because I'm going to read it. I just downloaded it. Our hero's quest collides with a the most gigantic event that's happened to Europe in 200 years. Yeah, it, it's uh, no, you hit all the high notes, Chuck. And I think the great thing about the way you wrote the book and, and the way you published it is that it's it's very much a Chuck Rogers book. It's not uh, something that was screened through some corporate publishing house. It's not something that was made vanilla by some corporate committee. It's uh, it's just Chuck. Being weird in certain points and, and writing uh, interesting stuff, and it's cool. I, I believe I'm the only person in fantasy who has addressed uh, elven bowel movements. Uh, in Lord of the Rings, no one staggers forward and throws up on Galadriel's shoes. So <laughs> things, things things stay grounded, and even though it's a fantasy, we we keep reality going. Yeah, on. yeah th well, there's a whole scene in here about a female orc princess going into heat. I'm just gonna leave it. At, I'm just, huh? I'm just gonna leave it at that. Uh, I may have written the first interspecies romance. I'm not sure in fantasy that wasn't a elven princess, right? Uh, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> that that looks like yeah, like a model. So, uh, out of curiosity, um, because you did say this was like a Dungeons Dragons quest. Uh, I mean, did sort you? Of, I, I, I'm just trying to find a metaphor for it. There's no. You can recognize things about it, but it's still, it's medieval Europe. Um, uh, I'm, I'm hesitant to call it a Dungeons and Dragons quest, except it, it sort of resembles one. I own it. Sure. Fine. No problem. Oh, no, I'm, I'm like, it doubles my intent to read it because you described it that way. I'm just curious, uh, do you or did you play Dungeons and Dragons? Like when you I reference it. I did between the ages of 12 and 14. So, yeah. And that, of course, influenced the writing of the book later in my life. Uh, awesome. Okay. Um, what you said that you enjoyed the fantasy. Well, first off, well, 12 and 14. I mean, that was still like the first and second edition, right? Of, yeah. Oh, I was a first edition Dungeons and Dragons player. Yeah, right after Chain. chain yeah. Um, since you said that you enjoyed the fantasy genre, like what are some of the books that you enjoyed growing up? Like what were some of your influence influences in the fantasy uh, genre? Like Jack, when I was young, I was a big fan of Robert E. Howard. Uh, 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 his clone, I forget the author of uh, Brack the Barbarian. Remember that? Yeah. One? Uh huh. Uh, I read fantasies voraciously. Um, the Belgariad saga. Uh huh. Um, the who's the guy who had leprosy he's the ring bearer i read most of those uh if you name a fantasy series i probably read it back in the day and when you finally got out there and published this book because I, I remember even though you say you had written it decades ago like you put a lot of work into getting this thing to the finish line and getting it out on the amazon uh what was the response like i mean were you happy with that whole process and how how it came out eventually um i've had nothing but good experiences with amazon uh, like I said, the, the hard part is getting exposure. I was lucky that uh, I'd written so many Mac Bowling Executioner books because I can just go on the Mac Bowling Facebook page and go, hey, look, if you like my writing, check out my Hero's Road. I could go on the Outlanders, uh, Deathlands, Face. That's another beautiful thing about social media. There's a Facebook page for everything. Yeah. So, one, all the Executioner books sort of gave me a work ethic. 
And two, it also got my name out there a little bit. Do you, do you go to cons and things like that in order to promote your book? I have not yet. Um, I don't know if going to a con and your book is not famous, whether that helps you or not. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You tell me. <laughs> if I just, oh, you show up with a wheelbarrow full of books going, oh, author will write for, for food. This yeah. I don't know if that works or not. Yeah. No. I, yeah, I don't know. And then Heroes Road 2, which I have not read yet. Was this, it was always planned as a series? This was something that you wanted to keep building on? Yes, I, I knew how the book was going to start, and I knew how the series was going to end. It was going to be a trilogy. It was fairly well mapped out, and I'm finishing up the third book now. As I kind of proud of myself, you know, I'm not going to milk this. I'm not going to write a fourth book or a fifth book or a sixth book. And then I was writing Heroes Road 3, I had an idea here. I had an idea there. I started writing some notes. And next thing you know, all, I could probably do a second trilogy. Really? And my brother's, oh, you whore. What is wrong with you? You <laughs> said three books. That's three books. But then I pitched it to him. He's all, that's not bad. So we'll see when and if that manifests itself. Before that happens, I probably want to write between five and ten Bastard of the Apocalypse, or, or Boda, as I call it for short. And tell us about that. That was the other one, your post-apocalyptic series that you've been working on that you gave it to me to read, and uh, I was blown away. I, I, I loved it. Um, so I was, long story short, I was hammering away on Heroes Road 3, and a good buddy of mine, Ron Miles, who actually I think of as my best friend who I'd never met, he's in Florida. And he had a fan site for the Deathlands and the Outlanders, and he loved my Deathlands books. So I get this email from Ron, never met him, and say, hey, I really like you. I'm all, you're my biggest fan. Okay, how, how creepy is this? But then he turned out to be a super cool guy, and he loved Heroes Road. And I'm not going to name the author, but he sends me this book. It was uh, post-apocalyptic. It's like 13 books in the series at this point. He's like, hey, Chuck, read this. And so I read it, and I'm all... This, this is garbage. Mm -hmm. He's all um, cookie cutter hero. You know, there's three jokes in the book. It's all wah, wah, wah. Hero front loaded with virtue. And I'm Ron, this is garbage. So read the second one. I'm like, I read the second one. He's like, read the third one. Like, Ron, what are you doing to me? He's all, you could write stuff like this. Uh -huh. And I'm like, I could write stuff like this in my sleep, Ron, but I need to finish Heroes Road 3 and I want to run another screenplay. Why are you forcing me to do this? He's all, Chuck, maybe writing one fantasy doorstop every couple of years maybe that's not a good business model for you i'm like god damn you oh no no no! i gotta finish here's road three and as usually happens to chuck i'm hammering around. i had a, an idea i write down a, next thing you know, i've got 40 pages of notes and before i know it i've stopped writing heroes road two and i'm writing this book i'm all, and i'm really enjoying it it was probably the most fun i ever had writing uh jack can tell you was chuck just completely off leash off the rails off the rails and I need a cover. So I contacted Mark Lee and he was in and he nailed that cover. I was so proud of it. And I posted on my Facebook page on a Friday and graphic audio had bought heroes road one and heroes road two for books on tape. And I don't have a deadline, but they, you know, every month or so I get an email. Hey, Chuck, where's uh, where's heroes road three. And I posted Mark's artwork for Boda also, I realized there's several people at Graphic Audio who follow my Facebook page. And I went, oh, dear God, I'm going to get the email on Monday from Angie Cornett, the VP, who was a lovely woman, great relationship with her, going, Chuck, you're writing another series? Don't make me come out to California. And Monday, there's the email <laughs> from Angie. And she's going, you're writing another series? We love it. We want it. And I'm all, wow. I'm all, you know, you haven't even read the book. She's all, Chuck, we read Heroes Road Unto just send it to us that's she fantastic wrote the check before she ever wrote it wow so, oh my god that turned out well <laughs> that is great so can you give us a, a little synopsis of, of bastard of the apocalypse um post-apocalyptic is like fantasy it's like westerns it gets very formulaic and so when my buddy ron tackled me put me in a hammerlock and just made me write a post-apocalyptic book if you talk to him he'll go Wow, I snapped my fingers and a book appeared. 
again, I want it to be different. And uh, you look at these books and like Westerns are almost all the same. There's a hero who's front loaded with virtue, like a Marshall Ron Miles is the last law and a world's gone wild or uh, gunnery sergeant Jack Murphy. He fought for his country in the mountains of Afghanistan. Now he'll have to fight to survive, fight for his family and fight for the new America that must rise from the ashes. He's going, ah. Congrats, devil dog. <laughs> So I just said, no, 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 no. So I decided, okay, my hero is going to be anti-hero. So he's actually not a nice person. He spent half his life on the reservation, half in the trailer park, and he not much to choose in his opinion between them. He joined the Marines to get out of that, and he excelled. He served overseas. He made force recon. He got injured by an IED, and he switched over to the MPs. Learned, so he learned police work. And then he's actually training like, to, to join NCIS, and then he did something which is not revealed yet, and it was bad. And it wasn't like Honus of Fear officers was raping a female cadet. He he broke the law because uh-huh. he, he he sort of and he did he was disarmably discharged and did a nickel in Leavenworth, and he got out and he drifted, and he actually wrestled professionally for a little while. He was in a biker gang, then got arrested. The FBI made him turn informant, so he betrayed them. And he's sort of drifting along, and a buddy of his in L.A. calls me, hey, Frame, why don't you uh, come out to L.A.? Hollywood could use a guy like you. And he thinks he's going to you know, be a stuntman or he's going to do some consulting work or something. And it turns out this studio has a problem, and they want him to fix it, and he does. So he, by day, he does private security work, uh, bodyguard. By night, he's a Hollywood fixer. He's sort of... He's Ray Donovan on the eve of the apocalypse. Uh-huh. Sort of, if he was a ex special forces guy, I don't know. Jack or are, are Marine special forces? Is that, is that allowed to say that? No, you're not allowed to say that, Chuck. All right, he he was a fine member of Uncle Sam's misguided children, <laughs> and so he's flush with cash. He's doing well. He's in a bar with his favorite bartender, and this sort of librarian seductress looking, pretty hot chick walks up to him. And she starts hitting on him and he's, I'm doing pretty well. And at a certain point, she, and it turns out that she works for the UCLA astrophysics department. And after she's had too many drinks, she tells him the world is going to end tonight. And that's where the story takes off. That's awesome. And if you guys are like burned out on post-apocalyptic or burned out on fantasy and you're just tired of the bullshit, like I'd highly recommend these books. Like, Chuck takes it in a totally different direction. It yeah. was fun. Uh, also, I took a big gamble. This was the first book I ever wrote in first person. And you got to be really careful with that because you end up being something like some cheap private eye novel. And all the gin joints in a world, she had to walk into mine. So I think I mostly avoided that and also gave you, here's the post-apocalypse and you're hearing our hero's thoughts about what's going on. So it gives you a much better window, I think. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, even though like this guy, this character is written as like the toughest man alive, but because it's written in first person, you also like see like his anxieties and his yeah. phobias and his insecurities, and it, it's all sort of in there. He's almost too much of a badass, except for the fact he's an antihero. He's had a pretty rotten life. Uh, he's not a good person, but he does have his own code, and he's. It's the first person that makes you able to identify with him, I think, like you said. Yeah, and in, in this post-apocalyptic setting, it very much, um, you know, what happens when you take a guy like that and just push him right over the edge? Like, what's he going to do to retaliate? <laughs> yeah, he pretty much commits some war crimes, so. <laughs> yeah. which is a lot of fun to write. But I had to do a lot of research, but that was, it just got funner and funner and funner. Do you want spoilers about the apocalypse? Uh, I don't. I don't know. What are you? What are you comfortable giving away, Chuck? Uh, Again, I'm looking around. Okay, you think post-apocalypse? You know, okay, there's a there's a plague. There's a nuclear war. There's this giant EMP pulse, which I, I never really thought was a good one. Zombies. Okay, and so I I, I looked around. And go. I have to find a different spin on the world ending. And you'd have to ask Jack, but I think I came up with a doozy that never been done before. I'm not. You you don't like the whole EMP pulse. It's well, if you actually go on Amazon, you're gonna look at this 
is a plague uh, post apocalyptic book. This is an EMP. It's, it's, it's literally, they're shoves genres. I, oh, I didn't, I didn't know that. Pigeon told in any of that. So I came up with something new and I was pretty excited about it. And what I did, as Jack can probably come, it allowed me to do whatever I wanted with the story. And I did exactly what I wanted with the story. I'm, I'm nice. really looking forward to it. I'm really looking forward to it. Um, I, I, now, how how long did it take from you know your your number one fan who fortunately didn't hobble you, uh, you know, putting this idea in your head to you having the finished product? That book happened really fast. Uh, one of the compliments I guess people reading go, Chuck, you can tell the author is having fun writing this, and that thing once I started it, it flew. Yeah, and and it's a it's a pretty thick book. I don't know how many pages it is, but I feel like I read that in like a couple of days. Like it's well, that's a- how I betrayed Ron. He he basically goes, Chuck, when you in between each hero's road book, you need a book seventy thousand words or less. You can grind out really fast, and then so Bash the Apocalypse ended up being close to two hundred thousand words. He's like, What are you doing? I'm like, I gotta be me. Got to be your most authentic self, there, Chuck. Yes, you do. <laughs> now, go I, had, I spent two decades being non-authentic horror for GE, and it's time to blossom. Right uh, now, going from like Mac Bowen, where you, you learned a lot you, about the military from talking to people and doing your research and things like that. Uh, like, how much does that play into, for instance, uh, Bastard of the Apocalypse and things like that? I, I, I did. I'm sure that more research had to happen, but you already have a wealth of knowledge to draw on already now, right? Right. And it, so do you find, I'm trying to figure out what I'm trying to say here. Sorry, it's very cluttered. Um, are you still learning new things about the military? Do you feel like you've got it all down? Uh, I learned a great deal about the United States Marine Corps. Um, as my father, who was in the Army, said, the he had explained there were, there were some, he's in the Korean War. There, he, when he was back on base, there's a bunch of Marines. And of course, he was in the Army. And there were some brawls. And my father was lieutenant. And after one of them, he, he dragged his men together. And as he famously said, men, much like the South Korean Army, the United States Marine Corps is an ally of the United States. And we must treat them appropriately. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, I learned our heroes Marine. I wanted to get authentic. I actually got a couple nice emails from some fans who looked me up who said, dude, were you in the Marines? Um, oh, um, no, but it's, it's, it's a noble profession. So I try to get my research right. And after doing 30 Mac Bolins, I'm, I'm pretty good at the research aspect. Yeah. Yeah, no, you you are, Chuck. And uh, that, I think that's why I reached out to you, too, um, because I initially... From reading your books and i was like wow this guy uh, it feels like he was in the military like he has a lot of like insight insight like insider kind of knowledge that i wouldn't expect somebody who's really just a, a pure author um to have honestly uh that's a great compliment thank you yeah i don't i don't know how you do it man but you do um so there's a, a sequel to bastard of the apocalypse coming um i'm thinking Again, as my friend Ron, he, he, had, he gave me like a whole business plan for how this should go. <laughs> I can easily imagine thinking, writing 10 of them. I don't ever want to be phoning it in. I told Ron, okay, if I, if I, get, if I do up to 10, number 11's on you, you're writing it. And so he went, ah. So he, he's, he's an aspiring author, so we'll see what happens. But I, I have a good story arc. I mean, each, each book is an independent adventure, but there's an overarching storyline of what's going on on the planet or what's left of it and after that storyline is finished uh once you have the apocalypse then our hero is probably gonna go out and explore a little bit uh one of the problems i had with the deathlands was it it was basically a western 100 years after nuclear war so our band of heroes would go to a town one of them would get kidnapped there'd be this evil baron they have to solve it and then drive to the next one you know our heroes were after the sun. I, I never wanted to be just formula so right. i'll keep doing it until i burn out 
And how do you decide? Because you want to you want to finish Heroes uh, Heroes Road Three, or you want to do that, and then you have this like. How do you decide between which one you're going to work on? Is it is it what inspires you in that moment? Do you have a plan? Uh, Bash of the Apocalypse one, as I mentioned, my friend Ron uh, side sidelined me, derailed me, and set me on this path. Uh, if I write another Boda before Heroes War is finished, finished, uh, Angie at Graphic Audio will kill me. So it's definitely finish Heroes Road three, and then start firing off bodas as fast as I can write them. Okay. And so when, when can we uh, look forward to seeing Heroes Road 3 in publication? Uh, everyone on my fan page asked me that. Angie asked me that. Um, <laughs> if I have a flaw that I write slow, uh, the good news is we're in the glide path towards the end. I've actually written the end, the end, and we're in the final chapter where the the great big battle happens and the, the, the senses shattering climax is about to happen. So hopefully within the next month or so. That's awesome. And the next month or so, so you'll get, you'll get the book out. Hoping. Really? Okay. So we're close to the finish line. All right. I'm looking forward to it, Chuck. Now, Chuck, people, people can go to your Facebook page. They can uh, follow you on Amazon. You also have a website. I had one. It was very clunky. I took it down, and I'm going to have a friend of mine who's a... Well, I live in Cupertino in California, near the hub of Silicon Valley. Sure. I have some engineer friends, so uh, a buddy of mine is going to put together a site for me. Great. Uh, let's see here. Uh, just a few uh, viewer uh, comments and questions. Andrew says, as a Republican, I have never not had nostalgia for the 80s. <laughs> Dickey says, what does Mr. Rogers consider his greatest work? I was very, very proud. Heroes Road was a love project. I, I'm proud of the work. Um, I, I was completely satisfied with the first book. I love the second book. I love what I'm doing with the third book. Uh, just about everyone I know who's read the books said they loved book one. They thought book two was even better. And my brother, who's my best critic, uh, he, he's not afraid of a red pen. He loves the way book three is going so i'm feeling pretty positive about it so heroes road has always been the love uh but geez boda is just so much fun i'm <laughs> i'm looking forward to getting back to that if that answers her question i uh, and andrew says uh lord fowl's bane by stephen r donaldson yeah yes, the, the shattered book. lands right thomas covenant yeah and then andrew says uh that is one uh that is book one of the Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, the Unbeliever, the yeah. man who had a white gold ring and leprosy. Right. And that reminds me, another classic Chuck Rogers, I remember, there was one where Mac Bolin goes undercover with an Islamic extremist group in Southeast Asia, and there's a spy girl who was friends with Bolin, and she gets captured, and they roll out the rug. And she was she was in it. Her name was like May Daisy May or something like that. Was she the one who was a she male? <laughs> I, I missed I pushing the boundaries. On I missed that part. There was the one woman, the the crazy Amazon woman that had those tongs. God, that sounds familiar. But that was that was probably over a decade ago. There, there's this Chinese special forces dude, and Mac Bolin is like running through the sand, and he finds a broken uh, like top of a beer bottle, and he puts it into a sling, and like wings it at the guy, and hits him in the head. I, I do remember that. I, I can't remember the book. Oh, uh, I can't remember the title of it either. When you were when you're done writing, do you go back and do you reread your books for entertainment, like Heroes Road or or uh, Boda or anything? Do you? Do you sometimes just kick back and read it? Not really. Yeah. Um, I go back and read Heroes Road 1 and 2 because I, since I write so slow, I need details of what happened for book 3. Yeah. Um, when Graphic Audio started uh, putting out my books on tape, or I guess people don't, they don't have books on tape. They, they don't even do it on DVDs. You just download them. But uh, I remembered the first time I laid back 
put on the headphones and I started listening to one of my books, I just, I completely freaked out. I, I, I was cringing. I didn't know uh, when you're a writer, you, have, you hear your character's voices in your head. Mm-hmm. Then you hear these act- and by the way, I love graphic audio. They, they, they knocked them out of the ballpark. But to me, every voice was wrong. Um, and the books are so big, there's certain parts they had to cut. And they were really nice about it and they did it really well. But why did you cut that part? But, you know, I love every part. So it, it's, it's difficult when they have to take something out. Uh, so I have gone back and listened to my books. And I, I freak out every time. Well, tell, tell us about that, about graphic audio, because it's like it's not an audio book per se. It's like a totally different way to experience your novels. Um, when I signed my contract with them, like if you sell them deck, uh, what you sell them is the abridged rights. So basically they take your book and rather than just uh, rather going, and now Bastard of the Apocalypse as read by Jack Murphy. Chapter one, it's they take your book and turn it into basically to a radio play. They have actors, music, sound oh, wow. effects, the whole deal. And to make that, since I started writing screenplays, I realized to take a book and condense it into a movie or a, or a sound screenplay is, is incredibly difficult. You have to make huge decisions about what to put in and what not to put in. Tell us about the nice thing is when you're doing that, uh, when they're doing voc- when they're doing voice, you get to cut out all he said, she said, because the actors right. are just saying it. Uh-huh, uh-huh. My books are this thick, and so they were really nice about it. Uh, I was lucky to work with the same director for the past three books. Uh, Brad, really cool guy, and he actually gave me input and sent me emails about what he was doing and asked me for like pronunciations. I've, I can't say enough good things about graphic audio. I have a tremendous relationship with them. Just from the production to the people in charge, they're just, they love what they do. It shows when what they do, and they've been awesome to work with. And where, do, where can people find these books? Is it graphicaudio.com? Yeah, you can go to graphicaudio.com. Uh, they got bought up by Audible. Okay. Audible company, so you can get it there. And I believe you go on Amazon. You can get the graphic audio books from there as well. Uh, tell us, tell us about your screenplays. When did you start that, and and what are they based? You know, the worst on? thing you can possibly do is ask a writer, "Hey, tell me about your screenplay. I mean, how many hours do you have?" Well, when did you start writing screenplays, and and what got you into that? Uh, my roommate in London, uh, he loves my writing, except for the fact that he he's never read any of it. He's loved the fact his buddy ended up turning into a writer. He's like, you should do a screenplay. You should do a screenplay. Why don't you do a screenplay? Uh, Have you read a screenplay? It's like if you speak Spanish, but you go to Brazil. I mean, they're speaking Portuguese. It's a completely different language. The structure's different. It just, a lot of it makes no sense. It's very hard. You either take a class in writing a screenplay or else you're uh, Quentin Tarantino and you work in a, a a video store for 10 years and, and watch 10,000 movies. Mm-hmm. And so my buddy, Billy C, he's like, you should write a screenplay, write a screenplay. And then we met for breakfast. And for my birthday, he bought me uh, this screenwriting software. So there you go. As I think it's called Final Draft. Mm-hmm. And I told you I didn't want to be, a, bless your heart. Ends up on the shelf for a year. And that stuff costs like at the time like 175 bucks. Mm-hmm. And then just just uh, for shits and giggles, I was trying to come up with a new Mac Bolin book, and uh, I just put the disc in, downloaded it. I started looking at it. I always had a couple ideas in the back of my head for a screenplay, but I figured it never happened. And this uh, software gives you all the formats. Uh, it will, it'll jump you from setting to scene to dialogue to action. It's very intuitive, and as you, the more you do it, you can actually. It's best to read some books from screenwriters, but this stuff pretty much does the hard work for you. All you have to do is come up with a decent screenplay and know how to write it. And so, I always had this idea for a horror movie called uh, The Praetorian, and I was always struck by the fact that hitmen in movies are, are non-sympathetic. You know, this, what you think of as a hitman mostly doesn't exist 
in the mafia, hitmen were were soldiers. The the uh, I was a soldier for the Murphy family. And if I killed people for them, I, I was part of their family. It's like a medieval knight riding out for his king. They weren't just someone who just killed someone for money who they didn't know with no affiliation, no animosity. Those are animals. Mm-hmm. Only the worst sort of people would do that. So I, I sort of dreamed up this idea that this group of guys trained in Italy called the Praetorians. And they'd be trained since they were little kids in assassination. And then they'd be given to a family when they were young and they would, they would do the work. And our hero, when we meet him, he's a functional alcoholic. It's sort of that thing like a Goodfellas and uh, uh, Vegas, where drugs ruin the mafia. Most Praetorians die just in stupid gunfights over drug territory. He's the last of his kind. And now he's actually, as he's, he's sitting, the, the screenplay opens, he's sitting in his car, in the rain and he sort of he's internally monologuing and he's talking about the fact that he's killed men he's killed women he's killed children he's killed people who don't deserve it and you see that he's got his revolver and he's got what he's, he's basically playing russian roulette and he's just saying now god help me tonight i'm gonna kill a priest spins it puts it to his head the music crescendos and it's click and he goes to do the job. And he sees outside this big cathedral, and there's all these limos, and all these people are, uh, there's going to be this great big party. This, this priest who's being sent to kill, it's a pillar of the community. He gives to charity. All the local politicians love him. And as our hero infiltrates, uh, we suddenly find out that this is a, a satanic ritual. They're going to sacrifice a nun. And then he blows it, and rather killing the priest, he kills the guy who's about to, he, and he's going, what the fuck, what the, what the, like, they drag out this naked woman, and they're putting a pentagram on her, and they're about to carve out her heart, and then he, he basically rescues her, drags her off the altar, and, then, uh, and this entire freakish satanic orgy start chasing him, and he's with the girl, and he's going through these catacombs, and, they, and he starts thinking, how can there be catacombs this extensive beneath this church, and the whole point is that uh, it's sort of, I wouldn't say it's like uh, angel heart, but as it turns out, who Satan really wants is him. Yeah, this is, uh, this is so basically, this is a trap to bring him in. So ah, gotcha. he would become, he would be in Satan's service. And then he comes to some, he has to make some very terrible decisions. <laughs> that sounds awesome. That sounds really good. I, don't uh, watch it. I, I actually, it's funny. A, one of my best friends, ex girlfriend, ended up screenwriting for uh, UCLA. I contacted her, Hey, Alice, how you doing? She's all, Hey, Chuck, I don't, well, I have this screenplay. So, you two, really? And you? All, yeah, I do. Could you look at it? And she did. And she loved it. But then she said, Chuck, it's, it's too dark. I mean, what do you mean it's dark? It's supposed to be a satanic horror. Movie. I said, no, Chuck, it reads like a book. All the, Every page is this big. You, you need space between the scenes, space between the dialogue, and right. she made me cut it down and cut it down and cut it down and cut it down until it turned into a screenplay. Um, and I can tell you, if I had a nickel for every nibble I've had from Hollywood, I could buy you both a pack of gum. Nice. Like, so far, we have we have not sold a screenplay, but uh, got some nibbles. Um, do you guys remember who is that guy who did on USA Today? He had his own horror movie show uh, joe bob briggs no uh he was he's texas guy cowboy hat you go all right tonight's movie is uh, beyond the living dead you'll see six breasts one beheading uh and a dog enjoy i'll see you at intermission and so he started his own uh, production company and i submitted it and i got a really nice letter back saying we love it But, you know, we have a budget of about a million dollars per movie. We can't do this. Sorry. I'm all, all right, thanks. That's great. And then I wrote a second, you know, the term around the block in movie writing? No. It basically means that, you know, rather than having to go to the Himalayas or having to get $10,000 CGI, you can do it around the block. You you get a hotel room. There's a street. You don't need anything except basically a camera. Yeah. Maybe some special effects. So I wrote a uh, around-the-block horror movie called Resurrection Joe, which was sort of a cross between Pet Cemetery and uh, uh, Reservoir Dogs. And it's about this 
heist that goes horribly, horribly wrong. And our hero is betrayed. And uh, his gang that betrays him, they're trying to beat out of him where the money is. And they beat him a little too hard. And he dies. And there's one person who goes, well, you know, out in that swamp, there's rumors where you, a body can, they can do stuff. And so he basically ends up getting resurrected. And it's, it's not a happy place for him. And then it, it turns into him trying to avoid the bad guys and avoid this horrible fate all at the same time. Wow, Chuck. And I sent that to them. And they never got back to me. And I believe that production house folded without really making any movies. But I wrote that script in six weeks, turn around to send it back. Wow. That And after that, I wrote seven short, basically a series of zombie shorts. Yeah. Uh, there's a, I forget the name of the company. They, they, they were specialized in horror shorts for uh, Sci-Fi Channel. Actually, no, maybe it was for Shudder. And so each one's supposed to be 15, 20 minutes or less. And again, I took the, I tried to, I'm, okay, horror zombies, but done and done and done. So I'm, what, what can I do different? And I think I came up with seven stories that were uh, very different. And those got a few nibbles, but uh, nothing's happened with them yet. D, want to make some zombie shorts? Yes. D made a movie. Yeah, our I'll send it to him. I, I love yeah, to Our producer movies. made an indie film uh, here in Brooklyn. Yeah. So maybe you guys could put your heads together. Yeah, for sure. I will put you guys. I have two horror scripts and seven zombie shorts. But happy to send them your way. I'll take the script. I like uh, feature. I want feature. Make features. Are you snob? I am a snob. Full length feature snob. We could sell features. The business no. has to come in. <laughs> yeah. Any way we can help you, um, whether it's with with your your novels or your screenplays, uh, you know, we'd love to. Uh, that is awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So Chuck, man, I really appreciate you spending some time with us tonight. Uh, anything else that you know you want people to know about? Anything that you want to throw out there uh, to the audience? Um, geez, now you you know the books I'm writing. Uh, any film directors out there? Chuck's bucket at uh, iCloud.com. Let me know. Uh, and you guys, it's been a kick in the pants. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And everybody, please check out his books, um, Heroes Road. And Bastard of the Apocalypse, uh, both of them are on Amazon. Um, you can either, if you're, you know, old fashioned, uh, you know, and, and like the hard copy in your in your hand, you can get them that. Or if you have Prime, you can download them for free and read them. I mean, on on your phone or, or reading device. So check them out. Yeah, they're 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 great books. Take them on vacation with you. Like it's a good like it's a long read, but like a good read that'll be like addictive. You'll be glad there's like five six hundred pages in the or, book. Or or check out fun. uh check out the um the Apple audios. Audio? Yeah, the audios on uh what was it again? Graphicaudio.net. Graphicaudio.net. Yeah. If you like sex, violence, sexy violence and violent sex, these are the books for you. I'm in. An all around weirdness. Just weird stuff. We try. There's weird stuff in there, guys. I'm just saying there's weird stuff. It gets weird. It gets weird. Well, Chuck, uh, yeah, I, I hope we can uh, we have the uh, talks again sometime, talk more about uh, Heroes Road and, and uh, Master of the Apocalypse when uh, some more of these books come out. And it's just been really, it's been really nice talking to you, man. All right. Uh, you two guys take care, and thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. And yeah, and we'll see all you guys on Friday. Uh, this is the bonus episode. So this Friday, we're going to have, um, oh my goodness, um, Wes. Wes, uh, who, geez, I'm sorry, I can't remember his last name off the top of my head. I have it here. Wes Bryant. Uh, he served as a JTAC in Afghanistan and Iraq. So we'll be talking to him in a couple days. And um, until then, we'll see you guys. Okay. Take care. Love well, that Patreon. Oh, oh yeah! There, if you want to get access to the bonus segments that we do, like this one, uh, you're, there's a link down in the description to our Patreon. Um, so you can sign up as little as a dollar a month to support the stream, support the show, and uh, we try to do two of these bonus segments every month. Um, plus, there's bonus segments with each of our guests, or almost all of our guests, plus these two bonus episodes a month that we do. For the price of a coffee, cup of coffee a month, you can keep two former Rangers in Lafroig. <laughs> and our lights turned on. <laughs>